All right, in Psalms 139, I want to read from verse 7 this morning. Psalms 139, beginning in verse 7. We'll read verses 7 through about verse 12. I'm going to preach a message this morning titled, God's Holy Presence. And we just uh, sang verse 23 and verse 24, and I'll make a few comments on that in just a moment. Now, about 10 years ago or 11 years ago, I preached a message titled, The Presence of God. We wrote an article. I'm actually going to use some of the scriptures in the article and sermon, and we'll still get do something just a little bit different as well. But notice as we come here, and I'm going to just again title this God's Holy Presence. You see your outline there. And we're going to basically look at the three dimensions of God's presence, I think, that we see in the Scripture. And we're going to focus on the last one. The first one is the God's universal presence, and then secondly, God's indwelling presence, and then the one I want to spend most of the time on is God's manifest presence. So notice now as we read from verse 7, it says here in verse 7, Whither shall I go from thy spirit, or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, Surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. About me rather. Verse 12, Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day, the darkness and the light are both alike to thee. Heavenly Father, we thank Thee this morning, as we always do, for another day, another week, another opportunity and privilege that we can assemble together in Thy house with Thy people of like precious faith. And Father, we come before Thee this morning, and we we thank You for the privilege to be able to fellowship, to sing, to preach, to pray. And Lord, we just ask now for Thy blessings and anointing to be upon the reading of Thy precious Word. And we pray, Lord, as we prayed hundreds of times, that You would speak to us by Thy Spirit and by Thy Word. And we ask all of these things in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. We see here in our text, reading verse 7 again, he said, he said in verse 7, Whether shall I go from thy spirit, or whether shall I flee from thy presence? We see as we come to the Bible the importance of God's presence in our lives as a Christian, and it is seen again throughout Holy Scripture, from beginning to From the book of Genesis to the book of Revelation, we see the importance of God's presence. Now, we all have experienced the nearness of God, and we also have felt times of distance as well. Can you say amen to that? We've all experienced both of those things. Now, let's come back to the verses we just sung here in verse 23 and verse 24, and let me read these before we get into any kind of an outline. Now I want you to notice that this is a revolutionary prayer of David. He said in verse 23, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way of everlasting. David is praying three things in this passage. He's asking God to search him, and then try him, and then lead him. This is a revolutionary prayer of David. Only 31 words. Anyone can pray it. He, David also knew what it was like to walk in the presence of God. But he also knew what it was like to lose his joy, according to Psalms 51. So he experienced both of those things. Walking in God's presence, seeing miraculous things take place, 
and then also losing the joy of his salvation. We see here in this prayer David's desire for the things of God, his desire to sincerely deal with sin. We also see here that how he prayed and how that he approached a holy and a righteous God. We also know in Acts 13.22, he was a man after God's own heart. Now, we sing this and we read this, but do we pray this? Have you ever asked yourself that? Have you ever really prayed this prayer? Because it is a blessed prayer, and some might even call it a dangerous prayer, to ask God to search you and to try you, test you, and then lead you. Well, if we pray this prayer, I'll promise you, and you need to expect results because it will change lives. It will change hearts. Now, when we come to the subject of God's holy presence, there's two extremes. And I think I put this in the article and the things we preached on 11 or so years ago. We find that the one extreme is is that God is unapproachable. I've had people tell me that. Well, he's just too holy for someone like us to be able to approach him. That's not a, that's not true. Then the other extreme on the other side is, oh, God is accessible, but he's uh, one of the guys. He's the buddy. He's the man upstairs. You know, that kind of attitude. But there has to be a balance in God's presence because he is approachable, but when When we come before Him, we must come before Him in reverence and sincerity and humility. He is very approachable. But that's how we must approach Him. Some verses I'm going to give you. We're not going to turn to all of them. I want you to stay right here. But in Jeremiah 9, verse 23 and 24, we find that the great importance of knowing God. He speaks of uh, the three areas of life that we boast in. And uh, strength and finances and, and things of that nature. He speaks of those. But he said the most important thing is knowing God. In Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 3, not knowing God led to Israel's failure and captivity. And not knowing God also in Romans 1 verse 20 and 21 led to nations becoming corrupt. And that is still true today in the time in which we live. So no one ever rises above their thoughts of God. We've got to really meditate upon this. One's belief or lack of belief translates into our actions and our attitudes. So what we're going to get into this morning is extremely important. Now first of all, notice with me, we're going to go to our first point. Notice in verse Let me back up and read from verse 1. I want you to notice in this section that we have here that God is all-knowing and God is all-present. Our first point this morning in your outline is God's universal presence. In other words, He's all-present. But notice beginning in verse 1, He says, O Lord, Thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my downsitting and mine uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou compassest my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, Thou knowest it altogether. Thou hast beset me behind and before, and laid Thy hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain unto it. So God is all-knowing. He knows everything about us. He knows He knows our motives, our thoughts before we ever speak the words. He knows everything about us, so never forget that. We cannot, we may deceive others, but we can never deceive God. So we find here that God is not only everywhere in heaven and earth, but God knows everything that goes on in heaven and earth, and in the hearts of individuals. 
God is a spirit and He is not limited to time and space. So we see the universal presence of God that everyone experienced to some extent. There's that common grace that God has bestowed upon all. I didn't say saving grace, but they experienced God's grace. I mean, even the lost, they enjoy God's sunshine. They enjoy the, the air that they breathe that God gives to them. They eat God's food. They enjoy a common grace in this world, even though they're lost. In other words, we find that His presence is seen in all of creation. Romans 1 and verse 20. So there is a universal presence of God. Verses 1 through 6, God is all-knowing. Verses 7 through 17, God is all-present. Now, we already read part of this, but notice again in verse 7, He says, "...whether shall I go from thy spirit..." Or whether shall I go from thy presence? You could ascend into heaven or hell, and you can't get away from God, according to these verses. Wherever that we go. And not only that, David, that writes this psalm, he even says in verse 13 through 17, that before he was ever formed, or as he was being formed in his mother's womb, the Lord was in charge of all of that. Notice this in verse 13. Well, thou hast possessed my reins and hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, that my soul knoweth right well my substance, that is his body. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret, that is, in his mother's womb, and curiously wrought in the lower parts of the earth. In other words, when he was unfinished, he wasn't completed. His body wasn't completely formed and so forth. And, uh, and also, when he talks about the lower parts of the, wor- the earth, that is an allusion to the womb as mysterious as the netherworld. In other words, as a woman carries that baby, you can't see it, but, there's the, but uh, that baby is growing and developing. And David is saying, while I was in my mother's womb... God was in charge of all of this. And he said in verse 16, Thine eyes did see my substance, that is his body, yet being unperfect. And in thy book, notice, all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. In other words, the days of David's life were written in God's book, affirming God's prior knowledge and plan of everything in his life. From conception unto death, the Lord said he knew everything about it, and the same is true with you and I. So what we have here is God's universal presence. Turn with me to Psalms, uh, Psalms 114. In Psalms 114, and notice here, and I want to read one verse from this chapter, Psalms 114. It's going to be in verse 7. By the way, Jonah could not hide from God's presence. The book of Jonah, chapter 1 and verse 3. He was never out of God's sight. He ran from God. He ran, the Bible says, from the presence of God and got on the ship and left. God brought about a storm. We know the story. And he could not hide from God. We find in Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 3, the whole earth is filled with His glory. In Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve had before walked with God in the Garden of Eden. You know what they did after they sinned? They tried to hide themselves. They could not hide themselves from God. God sought them out. He knew where they were at. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 13 says, Nothing is hid, all things naked and open to God. In Proverbs 15 I believe it's verse 13, the eyes of the Lord are in every place. Now notice as we read here in this passage, I'm reading from verse 7, Psalms 114 and verse 7. It says here, Tremble thou earth at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the God of Jacob. So when you and I consider the universal presence of God, it ought to bring great Comfort uh, to our hearts. Every believer should be comforted in these principles and every 
lost person, every unbeliever should fear and it should bring them to saving faith in Christ. Now let's go to the second point. Notice with me as we come to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Notice in 1 Corinthians in chapter 3. The second point is God's indwelling presence. That is in the believer. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. By the way, in hell there is no presence of God. In the lake of fire, after the judgment, it's eternal separation from God's holiness and His presence. Now notice as we come to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, there, every believer has a special relationship with God and His presence. We are basically a walking temple. We carry the presence of God in our life everywhere that we go. That's something to think about. Now notice as we read here in verse 16, I'm just going to take this out of its text. I'm going to read one verse, then move to Romans 8. He says here in, in verse 16, he said, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. So we see here that the Spirit of God dwells in every believer, Christ in us, the hope of glory. God Himself, by the Spirit, dwells within us. So, in that sense, we have God's indwelling presence. Notice with me in Romans chapter 8. In the book of Romans, in chapter 8. As you read through the book of John... John chapter 14, I'll give you the verse in just a moment. You find that uh, God promised that He would not only be with us, but that He would dwell within us. We'll read that in just a moment. Notice Romans chapter 8, first of all. He said in verse 9, He said, But you're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So it's clear in the Bible that the Spirit of God dwells in every believer. Can I get an amen? amen? Notice in verse 14 now through 16, this brings it even farther home to us. See, we're not, we are the temple of God. 1 Corinthians 1, 16 we just read. And so God dwells in His temple by the Holy Spirit. And so notice now, as I read from verse 14, that the Spirit of God leads us, bears witness that we are His children, and it cries out, Abba, Father. Notice this, verse 14 of Romans 8. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father, verse 16, the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Notice the Spirit. God's presence in every believer leads that believer, bears witness with our spirit that we belong to Him, and also we find here that that Spirit cries, Abba, Father, one of the most convincing Things that shows us that we truly are saved and belongs to Him because uh, this Spirit cries out unto Him as our Father. Notice John chapter 14. In John chapter 14 now. So we are the temple of God. The Spirit of God dwells in us. God's presence is in us by His Spirit. Notice in John chapter 14. When we receive salvation, we receive the Spirit. Write down John 7, verse 38 and 39. John 3 and verse 8, Jesus said and speaks of being born again, but being born of the Spirit. In 1 John chapter 4, verses 13 through 15, again it says, God dwells in us by His Spirit. Matthew chapter 28 in verse uh, 20, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. In Hebrews chapter 13 verse 5, it says, I, part of that verse says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. 
So we have the presence of God by being a Christian. Psalms 37 verse 25, God again promises that He'll never forsake us. And even in Romans 8, we are reading a moment ago, if you read verse 30, um, uh, 35 through about verse 37 or 38, again, God promises not to forsake us, but He also promises that nothing shall separate us from the love of Christ. Now, notice now, as we come to John chapter 14, and then we're going to move to our third point and kind of camp out there. Notice in John chapter 14, and I want to read verses 16 through 18. If you're taking notes, you could write down verse 20, 23, and 26. We'll say the same thing. But notice verse 16. I want to begin here. This is the, the upper room, again, the night before the crucifixion. And the Lord says this, He said, And I will pray the Father that He will give you another Comforter, that He may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it seeth Him not, neither knoweth Him, but ye know Him, for He dwelleth with you and shall be, notice, in you. I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you. So as he speaks to his disciples, he said, The Spirit dwelleth with you, but he shall be in you. So clearly, and there's many other verses, but clearly, God's presence is in every believer because they have eternal life and have the Holy Spirit in them. Now let us go back to the book of Psalms, and let us go this time to Psalms chapter 27. Psalms 27. Let's come to the third point, and this is where I really want to focus in on, and that is God's manifest presence. Psalms chapter 27. I just feel led this week to preach on this again. Some of the verses I gave 10, 11 years ago, or however long it's been, I'll give some of those to you again. We'll uh, look at uh, maybe a few extra also. But this is very, very important. When we come to the, all three of these points are important, but the third point is God's manifest presence. Now we know that God is in the universe, His universal presence. We know that He dwells in every believer. But what about God's manifest presence? When we come to the Scriptures, we find many saints, those who belong to God, we find many saints, many of God's people, seeking God's presence. Now, what is all of that about? Well, here's a, a good definition I will give you of God's manifest presence. That is, God manifesting Himself in particular ways at specific times to certain individuals and certain groups. In other words, God can manifest Himself in a very special way to an individual or to a congregation as well. Now, let's look at some examples of this as we come to Psalms chapter 27. Again, we come back to David. We notice here, I'm going to just read just a few verses from this particular chapter because I'm going to move to some other passages. But notice in Psalms 27, I want to read verse 4 and verse 8 and 9. He says here in verse 4, One thing have I desired of the Lord. Now this, now keep in mind, this is a saint. David was a saint. He was a believer. He belonged to God. And it says, One thing have I desired of the Lord that I, that will I seek after that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in His temple. Notice what David is asking as a believer, as a saint of God. He says, One thing have I desired of the Lord that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in His temple. David, here in this passage, David is in pursuit of the holiness of God. We're talking about now God's manifest presence. 
In other words, he'll manifest his self as to certain people at certain times, and especially in times of need. And so we find here that David is crying out and he's pursuing God's presence. And we all should do that as Christians. We see his universal presence. We have his indwelling presence as a Christian. But we should pursue his manifest presence. Does that make sense? Now notice again in verse 8 and 9. It says here, David, again, When thou saidest, Seek ye my face, my heart said unto thee, Thy face, Lord, will I seek. Hide not thy face far from me, put not thy servant away in anger. Thou hast been my help, leave me not, neither forsake me, O God of my salvation." Now, in the context, David is declaring that God is his strength in verse 1. But I just wanted to pick out a few verses to show you that David was a man that believed God had made promises to him. God made a covenant with him. But David says, I still want more. The Apostle Paul cried this way as well in Philippians 3. We know he was a saint of God. And he says, I still want more. Now notice with me as we come to Psalms 34. In Psalms chapter 34. Now here's some of the things that David had said. Just a few things if you want to write these down. Psalms 1611, David had confidence and joy in God's presence. In Psalms chapter 42, in verse 1 through 5, you'll find out, here that that David had a thirst for God, a spiritual thirst for God, as the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? This is a believer. This is a man that loves God. And, and he had a thirst and a hunger for the things of God. In chapter 62, we find here his crying out unto the Lord. He said in verse 1, O God, that thou art my God, early will I seek thee. And he said, My soul thirsteth for thee, my flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. And here's what he wanted to see. He said, to see thy power and thy glory, so as I have seen thee in the sanctuary. He said in verse 6, when I remember thee upon my bed and meditate on thee in the night watches. I'm just skipping around. But David had a hunger and thirst. He was seeking the presence of God in his life. Also in chapter uh, chapter 51 and verse 11, he feared of losing God's presence and power. In Psalms 84 verse 2, the soul longing for God's holy presence. The psalmist, many of them look at it this way. They're seeking God. Now notice in chapter 34... And I want to read basically one verse from this chapter. And you could put with this Deuteronomy 4.29. I think some of these verses are in the article. You could put with this 2 Chronicles 15.2 and also 2 Chronicles 16.9. What I'm going to be reading here in verse 18 is we see here that God reveals Himself to those who seek Him with a whole heart. Notice in verse 18, I'll read verse 18 and 19 together. He said, The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart, and save as such as be of a contrite spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. So we find here that God reveals Himself to those who seek Him with a whole heart, to those who are humble, to those who have a broken heart and a contrite spirit, even though in verse 19 we have many afflictions, and that's what He said, the saints, the righteous, have many afflictions, but the Lord says He will deliver us 
out of all of them. Amen. So, the, psalm, the other psalm that we sung this morning, in Psalms 46, verse 10, the verse 10 says, Be still and know that I am the Lord. That's one of the reasons I wanted to sing that whole psalm. Now think about this. I've had people tell me, well, I can't be still. You better get saved. If you can't be still, you need to get saved. God wants us to just sit down sometimes and meditate on Him. God wants us to sit down and think about Him. He wants us to talk to Him and He wants us to listen to Him through His Word and His Holy Spirit. I mean, I've had many people tell me over the years, well, I just can't sit down. You better learn to sit down. You better learn to sit down. When I was in construction work, and I'm, and I'm not bragging in any way for this. I had my discrepancies, and I still do. But when I was in construction work, we, we had a, a three-bedroom home and, um, for my wife and I and then our daughter. We had another room as set up as kind of a combination as a sewing room, and it, and it wasn't a huge room, but it had a little desk in there. And that's where we kept a concordance and a Bible dictionary and whatever. And Darlene could use the desk. I used the desk at night. When I would come home from work, after about 10 hours of work, uh, I spent time with the family. But one thing I did before I went to bed every night is I sat down at my desk and spent an hour in the Scripture and, and praying and things of that nature. We need that time with God. It may not have to be an hour for you, but uh, what I would do is that uh, the preacher, when he preached uh, on Sunday, I spent the rest of the week going over some of the things that he preached on. I wrote down the verses. I'd go back and go over them and look at the context. Because you know how preachers are. We don't always pull out all the context. We'd go and read a few verses here and there. And, uh, and I would go back and I'd just go over these things and I made sure that at night, uh, unless there's something else that you just had to do, I would sit down uh, each night and spend about an hour before I went to bed with the Lord. And we must have that time. Some people can call it quiet time, call it whatever you want. But he said, be still and know that I am God. And if you can't be still, you need to get saved and need to learn that God is God. The Bible said in Philippians 3.8, Paul cried out, as I mentioned a moment ago, he cried out, he said, that I, that I might know Him and the fellowship of His sufferings. This is the great Apostle Paul. He says, I want to know You, Lord. But he knew Him. But he said, I want to know You more. And then in Genesis 4, 8, we find that Cain went out from the presence of the Lord. That's what the Bible says there in Genesis 4, 8. But in Genesis 28 and verse 16, Jacob, the opposite of Cain, when he was traveling from his family unto another place that God had sent him, here's what he said in verse 16. He said, God is in this place, and I knew it not. God had come and special especially met with Jacob there on that travel, made promises to Jacob. Turn with me to Psalms 95 and notice with me. Uh, it's going to be verse 2, but I want to read the verse 7 verses. Psalms chapter 95. I want you to notice that we are commanded to come into the presence of the Lord. That's one of the things that we've done this morning coming to church. And God has promised in the Holy Scripture that when we come together that He would meet with us. He promised that in, I think it's Matthew 18 and verse 10 and other places. God has made that promise. Now notice as we read, I want to read from verse 1, a wonderful psalm here. And by the way, there's warning in verses 18 through 11. There's warning uh, to not, we're told not to harden their heart as Israel did in the provocation. Notice beginning in verse 1, he said, O come and let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before His presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto Him with psalms. 
For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods, and His hand are the deep places of the earth. The strength of the hills is His also. The sea is His, and He made it, and His hands formed the dry land. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down, and let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture, the, and the sheep of His hand, the day Today, rather, if you will hear His voice, the warning is given in verses 8 through 11 where Israel failed in this. But come back to verse 2, and notice in verse 2 He said, Let us come before His presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto Him with psalms. Now we can come into His presence in our private time. I'll show you that in a moment. But we see here also when we come together as a congregation, the Lord has promised to be with us. Now notice as we turn, and let's consider Moses in the book of Exodus in chapter 33. I want to consider Moses and also Joshua. We're going to turn to Exodus 33. We're going to be turning to Joshua in just a few moments. We're actually going to close in 1 Peter 3, but I'm going to give you some verses in between all of that to maybe just write down. Now notice as we come here to Exodus chapter 33, and I'm going to first of all read just two verses, and then we'll back up and read some other verses in the chapter. But notice I'm going to read verse 14 and verse 15. This is where the Lord is telling Moses to lead the people toward the promised land. And notice as we read in verse 14 and 15, And he said, My presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. And he said unto him, this is Moses, If thy presence go not with me, carry us not up hence. Don't you feel the same way? Amen. I mean, if God's presence is not in it, I don't want to be in it either. And so Moses, now you've got to realize when this took place. This is chapter 32, 3. Do you remember what took place in chapter 32? We find immediately after Israel's sins, and rebellion with the golden calf in chapter 32, immediately after that, we find these words. Moses had plagued the people and 3,000 died. Moses took the tent and carried it outside the camp to worship and to get it away from the people because God was judging the people. And so we're in chapter 33. And if you were to back up into this chapter and begin reading from verse... uh, actually the whole chapter, but especially from verse 8... The Lord is saying to Moses, He said, lead the people. Let's move on. They had just rebelled and sinned, and God had to kill some of them. And and the Lord had met with Moses face to face, according to this chapter, and spoke with him. But Moses asked for the presence of God to be with them as they travel on their journey. We must do the same thing. Moses did not want to go anywhere unless God was going to lead. Notice in verse 11, it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses face to face. Now what this means, we're going to see later, no one has seen God's face. Now you'll get to see God's face in death. (laughs) No one can see God's face and live, okay? We'll get to see His face one day. But when he says here that the Lord spake to Moses face to face, this means that he spoke unto him directly. In other words, he spoke to him in in a very personal way. It says, And the Lord spake unto Moses face to face, as a man speaketh with his friend. And he turned again into the camp, but his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, departed not out of the tabernacle. Now, what I want to do now is start reading in verse 12 through verse 18. Now, I just want you to see the context. So, God spoke to Moses face to face, showing Moses that he loved him, revealing unto him his divine presence, speaking to him as a man would speak to another man, 
In other words, in other words he's, he's uh, letting Moses know that he loves him and he's going to be with him. But I want you to notice as we read from verse 12 now through verse 18, I want you to see here that Moses is desperate for God's presence on this journey. We need to be desperate for God's presence in our life, in our family, and in our church. He, I'm telling you, he was desperate for this. He, he did not want anything else but to know that God was with him and with the children of Israel as, as, as he would lead them. Now let me begin reading in verse 12, just so you get a feel for the context. In verse 12, And Moses said unto the Lord, See, thou saith unto me, Bring up this people, and thou hast not let me know whom thou wilt send with me. Yet thou hast said, I know thee by name, and thou hast also found grace in my sight. Now therefore I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, show me now thy way, that I may know thee, that I may find grace in thy sight, and consider that this nation is thy people. you got to remember the sin and the rebellion and the killing and the plague that has just happened. So Moses is very conscious of the holiness of God. And, and we come back to verse 14 and 15. And he said, My presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. Verse 15, And he said unto him, If thy presence go not with me, carry us not a pence. Verse 16, For wherein shall it be known here that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight? Is it not in that thou goest with us? So shall we be separated, that is from other people, we shall be separated, I and thy people, from all people that are upon the face of the earth. And the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken, for thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. And you remember Moses was the one that interceded for the children of Israel after they sinned. He said, take my name out of your book. You know, he, I mean, that was his burden. But in verse 18, and he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. Now, I want you to think about this. Moses is desperate for the presence and the glory of the Lord to be with him as he leads the children of Israel. Now, they are three things that uh, I've spoken on in the past that is in this chapter, and I think they're very important, so I want to point them out to you. There are three things in the text that accompany God's presence. Now, we're not, we're not talking about the universal indwelling. We're talking about God's manifest presence. Okay, And this is what Moses is asking for. So there's three important things here. And again, this is in the article too. Notice the first thing is back in verse 13, is divine guidance. I'm just going to use those two words, divine guidance. In verse 13, Moses is saying, show me now thy way that I may know thee. And in verse 16, in verse 16, God said he would lead his people and separate them from all other people. We need divine guidance. And Moses is asking for divine guidance when he's saying, show me thy glory. Lord, your presence be with us. If your presence is not with us, we do not want to go. You and I live in a world of confusion. The world is filled with confusion. In the days of Moses, it was like that. And he wanted, he wanted truth. We may not see his face Today, but we can surely feel His presence. Okay, so number one, divine guidance. This is in the text, and this is one of the things that accompany God's presence. When God's presence is with us, in this way, we will have divine guidance. The second thing is in verse 14, divine rest. Notice in verse 14, And he said, My presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. That includes peace, 
and harmony and tranquility and a restless and a hostile society. They're in the wilderness. They're in the wilderness. There's many dangers. I mean, they have to go to God for their food, their clothing, everything, the water they drink. And so, there is a divine rest in the presence of God. In other words, there's a divine peace that Paul speaks about in Philippians chapter 3 and in verse 6. Now, there's the peace of God that passes all understanding. You can't even explain it, but you can experience it, and it will keep and guard our hearts from being penetrated by the world. In Matthew 11, verse 28, Jesus calls it rest for the soul. In Psalms 37, verse 7, rest in the Lord and fret not. It's easy to fret. We have all have fretted. I've got a sermon titled, Fret Not. My grandmother had this thing hanging on her wall. I said, I want a picture of that. Titled, Fret Not. You've heard me read that. Jeremiah 6 and verse 16, the old past. The Bible, God says there's rest in the path of God in the old past. But Israel said, no, we're not going to follow that. And they ended up in captivity for 70 years. I don't want to go into captivity, do you? So the first thing that accompany God's presence is divine guidance. The second thing is divine rest. I want that. And the third thing is His divine glory. Notice verse 19 through 23. And He said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I'll proclaim the name of the Lord before thee. It will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And he said, Thou canst not see my face, but there shall, for there shall no man see it and live. The Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me. And, and he says, And thou shalt stand upon the rock. And it shall come to pass, while my glory, that is his presence, while my glory passes by, that I will put thee in a cliff, that, and notice this, in a cliff of the rock, and will cover thee with my hand while I pass by, and I will take away my hand, and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. Moses also experienced the divine presence and glory of God, a display of His majesty and power. And as you step into chapter 24, verses, one, uh, verses um, let me see here, chapter 34, I'm sorry, chapter 34, notice, come down with me to verse 5 through 9, we must read this to, to continue this thought here. He said in verse 5, and the Lord descended in the cloud and and stood with with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord passed by before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquities and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity upon the fathers of the children, upon the children's gener- children's children, rather, and the unto the third and to the fourth generation. I misread part of that looking down for verse 8 and 9. Notice in verse 8, these are the two verses I really want to read. In verse 8 and 9, And Moses made haste. Now notice what he did. Moses realized that he's going to have divine guidance. He's going to have a divine rest, peace and harmony and tranquility in a restless society. And he also realized he's got, going to have divine glory. In other words, he's going to be living in the presence of God in his glory. And here's what happened. And Moses made haste and bowed his head toward the earth and worshipped. And he said, If now I have found grace in thy sight, O Lord, let my, let, let my Lord, I pray thee, go among us. For it is a stiff-necked people and pardon our iniquity and our sins and take us for thine inheritance. So he falls upon his face when he sees what God is going to do for him and do for the children of Israel, even after they sinned 
and have repented of that, we see these three things that accompany God's divine presence. And each and every one of us can have the same thing. Now, turn with me, please, to Joshua. And notice with me, Joshua is the one that takes Moses' place. In the book of Joshua in chapter 1, I'm going to begin reading in verse 5. Joshua chapter 1 and verse 5 through verse 9. And I want you to notice the promise that God made to Joshua. There's many other verses that we could consider this morning. In Genesis 21 verse 22, uh, God told Abraham, it says, God is with thee in all that thou doest. In Judges 6 verses 12 through 14, God told Gideon, he said, the Lord is with thee. In Jeremiah 15 and verse 20, God told Jeremiah, I am with thee to save thee. In Isaiah 43 verses 1 through 5, the Lord basically says in those verses, I am with thee in the flood and the fire. In other words, the promise of God's presence. Again, in Matthew 18 and verse uh, 20, I think I told you verse 10 while ago, verse 20, the Lord says, where two or three are gathered together, He said, I will be in the midst of thee. God has promised in the congregation. He's not talking about three guys on the bank fishing or whatever on a Sunday morning. He's talking about the church. He mentions the church in the previous verse, but he's talking about the church coming together in worship and also having to make decisions with things. He said, I will be with you. Now, what about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? In Daniel chapter 3, they refused to bow before Nebuchadnezzar's idols. And they said that we believe that God will deliver us. They were threatened with the fiery furnace that's heated up five times hotter than it was. And they said, we believe that God will deliver us, but if He does not, this is where we stand and this is what we're going to do. They were willing to go into the fire because of their faith, even if they were not delivered. They had courage in the midst of adversity. Why? Because of the promises of God. And they would be either be delivered in life or in death, but either way they're in the hands of a holy and righteous God. And we know this story. Nebuchadnezzar looked down in the fire, and there's four in there. One is the Son of God, and God's presence was with them. When they came out of there, uh, there wasn't even the smell of smoke on their clothing. God had protected them. But they were willing to stand, they were willing to go in, even if they died. They were willing to do that, because they knew that even in death, you're just ushered into the presence of of a holy and righteous God. So notice the promise to Joshua. Verses 1 through 4, Moses has died. They're in the wilderness. It's time to go into the promised land. I begin reading in verse 5, And there shall not any man be able to stand before thee, talking about Joshua and the children of Israel, all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so shall I be with thee. I will not fail thee nor forsake thee. So Joshua has the same promise. Divine guidance, divine rest, and divine glory. And he goes on to say, Be strong and of good courage, for unto this people shall thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give thee. Only be thou strong and very courageous that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. Now notice the next two verses. And then we're going to turn to the New Testament. We'll be closed in a few moments. But notice in these two verses. He said in verse 89, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, 
and then shalt thou, I'm sorry, and then thou shalt have good success. It's the only time the word success is used, I believe, in Scripture. And he said, you shall have good success. Verse 9, Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of a good courage, be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. Notice, God promised his presence to Joshua and the children of Israel if they would be obedient to him and follow him, that he would carry them into the promised land and Joshua was the one that did lead them and gave them the inheritance in the land. Now, let us go to one last verse and that is in 1 Peter chapter 3. In 1 Peter chapter 3, we'll begin reading in verse 12. While you're turning there, two other verses I'll give you. Hebrews 10.22 says, Let us draw near with a true heart. So this drawing nigh to God, seeking God's presence, is not only an Old Testament principle, but it is a New Testament principle. James 4 and verse 4 says, Draw nigh to God, and He will draw nigh unto thee. Now, we're not talking about the universal presence, the indwelling presence, but we're talking about the manifest presence of God. There's, uh, we want to walk in that, and there's times of desperation when we need that. We need His guidance, we need His peace and tranquility, and we need to see His manifest glory and power in our lives. So let us close here in this passage. I'm sure that if I open the floor again, we've already gave testimony, but I'm sure if I open the floor again for testimonies this morning, I'm sure that many of you, if not all of you, could stand up and you could give testimony at particular times in your life when you knew that the presence of God had come up on you and helped you and guided you and given you peace. I could stand here for the rest of the afternoon and give you different events and stories of how God has done this for me. And I know that each of us give. Maybe we'll take a service sometimes and that's all we'll do. We'll just talk about times that we felt and sensed and knew that special manifest presence of God. And I've given you some testimonies for I remember. I remember... One time, and uh, things were fine in our life, and uh, we, I was in construction work, we were involved in the church, we uh, had the pastor even preaching in our home and different things, like things were good, we just built a new home, the business was great, and, uh, but I, I kept asking the Lord, you know, what else do you want me to do? And, uh, and we, we not only tithe, we gave almost double, and I'm not bragging, it's just things we just wanted to do. We just wanted to do these things. I'd put my pastor on the radio at that time, and, but we, where we lived at, there was a huge field behind us and a big mountain, the foot of the mountain, you could walk to the foot of the mountain. And I'd go back there, and I used to hunt back there as well as go back there and pray. I remember praying one time, and I'm praying to God, and I said, uh, what do you want me to do? And I really believe, not an audio, audio voice or whatever, but I really believe God said, just keep doing what you're doing. We were, I was doing everything I knew to do. Um, we were working, providing for my family, for the ministry. Um, we... Um, we were having our pastor come and preach. I was having people come from our neighborhood to hear my pastor preach. We lived a little distance from the church, about 40 plus miles. And, and, and the Lord, I believe the Lord spoke to me. I believe He spoke to me and said, just keep doing what you're doing. And, uh, and we, within a year or so, He did call me into the ministry, but He gave me peace about what I was doing. Working my job, feeding my family, you know, being involved with the church and ministry. And I'm sure you could stand up and say the same thing. I'm sure uh, you could stand up and just give testimony after testimony.
Uh, when I first uh, moved here, uh, went through some trials and tribulations with the church. And I remember going to Dolphin Island, 1990, around May or so, April or May. And I remember spending all day walking. I, I went to the very end, the west end, and back. I think it's a total, I forget how far it is, it's, I think it's seven miles each way. I think the whole island is 14 miles. And I'm praying and crying and I'm carrying my Bible and reading the Scripture. And by the time I got, before I ever got back, the Lord gave me peace as what to do. Gave me peace and I knew that the Lord had spoke to me. We've had a lot of good meetings in this church, and we've seen the glory of God and the presence of God, but one summer in 1995, going through some problems. I remember coming in through the summer and laying in this, the middle of this floor right here, sometimes for three and four hours at a time, crying and praying to God for weeks. And God gave me such a peace and intervened, I felt His presence and intervened and took care of the situation. I, I'm just saying the Lord will meet with us if we will seek with Him. There's, there's a place that's called Tanny Hill, south of Birmingham, this side of Birmingham. Used to be, I hadn't been up there in years, one of my favorite places to go. It's kind of the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains. It's a beautiful place. Um, you might, people may just call it hills there, but I call it mountains. Because when you compare Coden and Mobile, the highest thing is a speed bump. And uh, so I call it mountains, but we went, we, we used to camp up there occasionally. And I went up there, we was going up one time and I asked, told my wife and daughter, I said, I, I want to go up two days or so before, and then you come, we'll spend the rest of the week. And I wanted to spend some time, you know, meeting with God, just by myself. And I would enter into the woods. They had paths everywhere, and I'd enter into the woods every morning, daylight, and I would go and I'd climb this, I'll call it a mountain. It was a hill, huge hill. And I would just sit up there until about noon and just read the Bible and pray and seek the Lord. We've seen the Lord's presence again in our church service. I'm sure you've seen it in your private life. And I told you the one time, 1988, August the 1st and August 2nd, I did a public debate. As I look back on it, I don't even believe in debates. I didn't really believe in them then, but I, I agreed to do this. And there was some very false doctrine that we debated against. And one of those was baptismal regeneration. And I was bothered. I was bothered about all this. But I didn't have time uh, to really make great preparations. And the other pastor had went off to school to debate me. Because in their religious organization, they did a lot of debating. And so I'm having to work. I'm having to live life and preach and pastor a church. And so the night, I believe it was the night before the debate, I decided uh, the phone was ringing and this, and uh, it was publicized in the town there in Selma. And they had it at an auditorium. And I think there were about 300 people or so, at least that many showed up. And so I told my wife, I said, I've got to go somewhere and prepare. That's the night before. I drove the Montgomery. The only time I've ever owned a new car in my life, 30 days old, that car, just 30 days. I pulled it in. I got a motel room. I spent most of the night up and preparing and praying and seeking God. I was a little fearful. Had a truck come in and hit that brand new car. Bumpers hanging down off of the side of it. I came out and he's just standing down where he talked. I said, I'll oh, forget it. I, I just tied the bumper up and I, brand new car, man. And I said, I've got to meet with the Lord tonight. So I did. I was very fearful in my heart. 
and there were 15 preachers came on the other side. And I called one man and I said, would you be my moderator? He said, yes. He kept the time. And so when, so when we walked in this huge auditorium, we got there early. And you've heard me tell this story. We got there early. My heart is pounding. That's probably where I got AFib. My heart is pounding. And we're walking down, and my wife and my friend and his wife, and we're walking down this huge auditorium, and the stage was extremely high. And I, again, I'm, I'm fearful, but I'm, you know, I'm going to go through this. I walked up the steps, and my friend was standing at the corner, and I walked from this side, and I walked over, and I walked to the podium, and I put my hands on the podium and I stood there. And I had such a peace. I think that was the most I've ever experienced. The peace of God. And I turned around to my friend. And we had a table there. That's where he was to sit. He was to keep the time of, you know, when I'm speaking. We went three hours for two nights. August 1st, August 2nd, 1988. And I turned around and I said it to my preacher friend. I said... The battle is won. I said, we have the presence of God with us. And that's exactly what happened with the meeting. Those are just a few examples. There's many, many more. Now let me close here in 1 Peter. So I've experienced this. You've experienced it. I want to experience it a lot more. Um, I... I want to have the peace and rest of God and know that I am in His will. And by the way, he, when He manifests Himself this way, He will let you know. He will let you know. So let us come here to this last passage. As I heard someone say one time, look for His footprints in our life, for He is working. God is working in every Christian's life that loves Him. Now notice as we read from verse, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 12, For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and His ears are open unto their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Verse 13, And who is He that will harm you if you follow if, if you be a follower of that which is good. But, and if you suffer for righteousness sake, happy are you. He says, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. Now let me skip verse 15, read verse 16, and come back to verse 15. He says, having a good conscience, that whereas they speak evil of you as evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse you your good conversation in Christ. Now notice back in verse 15. Do you see the promises that are given to us here? His eyes will be upon us. His his ears are open to our prayers. He will protect us. He will guide us. Even when we suffer, He's promised He would be with us. And we will suffer if we serve Him. And he says in verse 15, notice here, he said, but sanctify the Lord in your hearts. You know what that means? That means a lot. One thing it means is let Him reign. Let Him have His rightful place on the throne of our hearts. Let us not reign and rule our lives. Let Him reign. And notice he says here, in verse 15, he said, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. We are to sanctify the Lord in our hearts. Let Him reign. Give Him His rightful place upon the throne of our hearts, and He has promised to have His eyes open to us, His ears open to our prayers, 
to protect us even when we suffer, that He would be with us. He said, be not afraid of their terror. Would you stand with me, please? Father, we do thank Thee this morning again for this privilege. We thank You for Your Word. We thank You for Your Holy Spirit. Lord, we thank You for Your church. Father, help us this morning to always seek Thy presence. We find Old Testament saints, New Testament saints, seeking Your presence, drawing nigh unto Thee. Lord, help us to be a people that will always be seeking Your presence and Your glory in our life. And we ask all of these things in the Lord Jesus Christ's name. Amen.